Analyze Asia is brought to you by Esavel. Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams across Asia Pacific? Then you know how painful that can be. Esavel helps your in-house team by taking cumbersome tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across Asia Pacific from onboarding, procuring devices to real-time IT support and offboarding. With our state-of-the-art platform, gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place. Our team of IT support pros are keen to help you grow. Check out esevel.com and get a demo today. Use our referral code ASIA for 10% off. Terms and conditions apply. I think one of the things that TSMC does is that they tend to hit their targets. When they say they're going to build something or they're going to do something, they do it. I think that when you contrast that with other companies in the industry, like for example, a particular company in America that says and sets a certain deadline and misses it repeatedly, that has an effect on your credibility. TSMC has always said that they're going to hit a certain number. It's like a pretty good chance that they'll hit it. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leong, and China has been developing their own semiconductor technologies, but Taiwan is leading the race with three nanometers. Why is it so difficult to replicate TSMC elsewhere in the world? With me today, John Wai, founder of Asianometry, to help us decipher the puzzle of global chips shortage. John Wai. Welcome to Analyze Asia for the first time. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. And I actually have been following your YouTube channel and your newsletter and dive much, much deeper into what you have been talking about in terms of semiconductors and TSMC. But then as a first time guest, I want to know your origin story. How do you start your career? I was born in the States, United States, and I grew up there. And I graduated from Berkeley and spent about 10 years in the Silicon Valley kind of mostly doing some marketing stuff, jumping around, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And eventually it got to the point, I got burnt out after doing some marketing work and decided I wanted to go to Asia. I didn't know where in Asia, just somewhere in Asia. So I interviewed with four places in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and Shanghai. And I got offers for all four, and but I decided to pick Taipei. So I came to Taipei about six years ago and really expected to just be here for six months but it turned out it's been six years. It's crazy. So since then, I've been working, still working as in, in marketing and a financial analyst for an AI firm. And have you been thinking about even moving to the other countries in Asia that you have actually previously picked like the other three? I would love to spend some time in Singapore. I have some really good friends there and I like their, I like the culture. I like the people. They're very nice. So that's so far, no, I'm, I'm staying in Taipei for a while. It's kind of home for me. Mm. I'm pretty curious, and you really do this very well in terms of explaining things in the semiconductor space, or even generally in tech as well. What is the inspiration behind starting Asianometry? Asianometry began as a kind of a tourist travel channel. So it actually started with me posting my videos of like hiking and kind of going to sea hikes and seeing various landmarks in Taipei. So that was about five years ago. And I started out with that and just kind of had a good time, but I also really like to learn and share things. And so the, the video essay part of the, of the channel came out from that sort of experience. I just really wanted to kind of, I'm always, I'm reading, doing lots of learning with just by myself. So this was just a way to kind of share that also with other people and challenge myself to say stuff to, to, to learn and learn and kind of find interesting things to say. So generally just come out of passion and just interest. How about they eventually pivot into this present form where you do a lot more about technology? I mean, your understanding is of TSMC is quite in depth. And I would, I would say that if that's almost at the level of a very, like a, probably a good analyst from well, some of the top firms in the region would, would be able to convey what's going on there. Oh, no, I, I definitely would not be. I mean, I don't work with financial models or anything like that, but it's just a matter of kind of being really resourceful with the internet and spending a lot of time learning and being really obsessed with stuff. I think there are a few other kind of like semiconductor analysis types in the on the internet, I guess. I think the way I would always describe it is that they're really obsessed. 
They're very detail oriented. That kind of just grabs myself too. For myself, I like learning things and I like kind of explaining. I like it when 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 something nice comes out of it. And I enjoy what it helps other people. I mean, it's better than filling their heads up with trash, you know? It, it definitely did help me to understand more about the technology. What are the highlights of the newsletter and the YouTube channel? I think the YouTube channel is now more than 100, over 1,000 of subscribers, right? I think it's about 300,000 plus plus. Yeah, yeah, 300,000. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's a very sizable audience from a YouTube point of view. Yeah, last year I had, what, 100,000, 20, 120,000, and now it's 300,000 plus. It's insane. I never expected to get this big. Do you think that it's because of the subject matter that actually draws a lot of people towards watching the videos on your YouTube channel? Yeah, I would say so. I think the I was very fortunate that to come along during the chip shortage and a lot of people talking about the chip shortage and these companies, TSMC and ASML. Like if I was in well, I was in Singapore or I was in if I were to be in Hong Kong at the time, I, I'm for sure I would not make videos like this. Uh, the only reason I really would end up starting to get more interested in TSMC was because it's here in Taiwan. And I had the chance to kind of, I mean, people, people were obsessed about it here. So they talk about it all the time. Being in that sort of environment, I think is, is a big deal. And I think that your marketing background helps you to translate it to the rest of the world as in, what does it mean? Uh, absolutely not. No, my marketing background <laughs> is <laughs> related to like <laughs> SEO. <laughs> Which, which topics to pick? <laughs> Very honest, authentic answer. So I want to ask you this. In your career journey, what are the interesting lessons you can share with my audience? I think you need to be prolific. One of the secrets, I think, to getting success is to continue to put out content at a very consistent pace over time. You don't get success from making one video. I didn't have success on my 50th or even 100th video. It wasn't until like video 150 or 200 that when started to see some real traction. So I think you really need to grow. If you want to grow, you have to be prolific. You have to be able to experiment with your, with your products and just really understand kind of what your audience wants and not want to. So that's, that's, I've, I've learned a lot of interesting lessons about kind of building the machine that creates the content is just as interesting as the content itself. Mm. And that comes to the main subject of the day, which is I want to talk about TSMC, global chip shortage and semiconductors. I think mm -hmm. to really jumpstart this conversation, can you explain the chip development from start to finish? For example, how did the chip ended up in our laptops, mobile phones, or now even in cars as well? It's almost like almost into any industrial product. If you are a kind of a system integrator that makes the product, for instance, like a mobile phone or something like that, you, you work to collect the spec of what the chip will do, what needs to be done, and perhaps you take it off the shelf, right? Uh, there's a company in Taiwan called MediaTek, which makes a large business from simply offering chips and microprocessors to other companies. In certain situations, you decide that you want to make the chip yourself, or there's a special chip that you can't do for any other company but yourself. And in this case, once you know what that chip has to do, you kind of work together to create a design of it. And then unless you and then you, once you have that design, you start working on making that design into a real chip by going to a fab. Most companies would go to a fab. I wouldn't know of any other company that creates their own fabs now, foundries now. They, they go to a fab, commission with them, and get that order done. And the chip goes off and it gets done within six months usually. And from there on, it gets the chip, even once it enters that flow, basically, it gets fabricated tested, and then packaged. So testing, meaning make sure it meets all the specs. Packaging, you take a piece of that wafer where the chip comes off, roll it into a kind of a ceramic package or a plastic package or put together with all these other different chips, in the case of chiplets, for instance. And then you, from there, integrate it into the rest of the system. I hope mm. that makes sense. I kind of just okay. threw and everything then, in there. I see. And then the system goes into the phone as part of the the package or is there, is Most that how system it integrators works? would just, yeah, that's the system itself, for instance, or in the case of a car, right? This is like a tier one supplier that has a component that they then want to pass to the main, to the car maker or the automaker. So 
it really depends on how the chip is going to be eventually be used, but it really differs. It's it's a really fundamental part of the technology that runs our modern day life. Mm. So one thing I want to drill down is the chip shortage that has been reported globally. And I actually want to get a sense of where is the global shortage really come from. Can you provide an overview of the different fabs and semiconductors in the market? I mean, specifically one thing I did got a lot more clarity after reading one of your articles where the real chip shortage is, is that it's specifically on the sizes. Like for example, UMC specializes in 65 to 28 nanometers. Um, they have a monthly revenue growth now of 35% in August, 2022. And then you have TSMC, which is gunning really at the frontier edge of the three nanometers piece. A little tougher now to say that there is a chip shortage because the economy seems to be deteriorating so quickly. I would say right now, the, the biggest, when, when I wrote that piece, when I did that piece, the main thing I was thinking about was that there is a very small subset of companies that can benefit from a node using a process node of a 14, 7, 5, or even and 3 nanometers. However, those chips lead basically the industry and the value, right? right? You have a 5 nanometer wafer that costs something like $17,000. It's an immensely expensive and high-priced chip. And for those companies, you know, they, they are the cream of the crop. Only two or three companies make chips at that leading edge. The majority of what goes into ordinary products like your mouse or your microphone or something like that are generally going to be far older than that. Like you're talking about things in the 130, 65, even 28 nanometer range. Even 28 is a bit ambitious, right? Most of the, for example, a lot of your stuff that goes into, for instance, military supplies in the United States would be something in the 65 nanometer range and higher. Generally, these tend to be constrained by physical restraints, for instance, analog or a radio frequency chips, they tend to be made at a bigger process node because they don't need to be at like a five nanometer because those chips would be half, they have, they have physical constraints that literally mean that they cannot, it makes no sense to make them with anything else. For instance, if you think about the wavelength of a particular of a radio frequency, right? It's very large and the chip needs to accommodate that. So that generally what so generally the chip shortage has been more on the trailing edge part of the of the curve because a lot of these chips are used for various products and these various products have a lot of specific needs that need to be met. In certain times, you have a situation where the trailing fabs did not invest in capacity because there wasn't any profit in it. And when the chip shortage or when the surge in demand happened, the foundries could not meet it. And specifically, like say a mobile phone, you, would they be in the leading edge or something like the desktop laptops? Are they in the leading edge or more in the wider range of the uh, common chip sizes? It depends on the component. So your CPU might be at a leading edge, but then you might have other parts of the system that handles Wi-Fi or whatever may have you which they are certainly, they also need to be made. They also need to be fab. They just have with a different process. Your car, for instance, your car is seeing a lot more growth on, on the electronic side because they're turning to electronic vehicle. You're having a lot more electro electric vehicles come out. So you're th now you're th thinking more about a lot more chips going in, a lot more sophistication going in, but still a lot of these chips are kind of trailing edge. Because there's also new constraints, like for instance, they need to be they need to handle certain heat pressures, certain conditions that make it difficult for in like a seven or five nanometer chip. So what is the landscape for semiconductors? I mean, other than TSMC, which we know, how do we look at the other companies in the space? I mean, there's Samsung in Korea, there is SMIC in China, there is Vedanta in India, and Intel and other US chip makers that are now supercharged by the Chips Act in the US? The landscape is interesting, I would say. You have a situation where TSMC always had a very strong market share in what is called the, the foundry industry. So there's two types, so two types of companies in this space, right? You have integrated design manufacturers, so that would be your Intel or 
ST Microelectronics or something like that. They own the facility and they design whatever they're making. Then you have a large amount of fabless companies like your NVIDIAs or AMDs that basically, well, you're talking, I think you're, you're, you're only specifically talking about semiconductor manufacturing, right? So, so yeah, so then you have the foundries, right? So the foundries and the guys who kind of do what they, who kind of design a little bit of what they make as well. So in the foundry space, TSMC leads as, and has generally led since the beginning with, I think with 50% market share. And since then you have kind of, you have kind of a second source so that's kind of like your second biggest supplier. That would be Samsung generally. And then you kind of have niche or third level suppliers like your UMC or global founders or something that hit a specific need, right? I would say with the CHIPS Act in the United States has focused on my best understanding is that it's focused on building up capacity for domestic supplier, domestic suppliers. Now, generally, I think basically Intel and Texas Instruments, maybe. And so there are a lot of new builds coming out in the semiconductor industry that were announced a couple of years ago in times when a lot better. Now, we can't, now the economy is starting to deteriorate much quicker than we all thought. And... I think the biggest interesting thing is that is it going to continue? Are they going to build it out what they said they build out? Mm. And then, for example, SMIC in China, how are they compared to say a, a TSMC or even Samsung? Are they very far away, or are they just still at the beginning stage of development? We don't know. So, like mm. we we have a good understanding that the majority of the revenue comes from a specific kind of trailing node, but the company is making rapid progress and there are we know of situations where they, they're coming out with products using kind of what is in a, something equivalent to what we would call a seven nanometer process so but is that thing how well it yields what's the profitability can it be used to make something much more sophisticated than that we don't know and also they're handicapped by the fact that they don't have an ASML machine. So. They have ASML machines. They probably have the older immer immersion and kind of dry lithography machines at the 193 nanometer wavelength. What they do not have is the UV machines, which I think are, for, of course, essential to go to making an N5 chip or N7 chip economically. They don't have that. And, and developing the machine is probably difficult as well. I don't think it's economically feasible to build another. I think one of the reasons why ASML is the only one who builds it, who can build it, is because ASML is you know, the industry literally cannot afford another company to be building something like this. I, I like the deep dive that you've done on the three nanometer process, where you've done a clear explanation of the technology and why it matters. Can you talk about how leading edge semiconductor processes nodes are made? That wasn't specifically necessary for the three nanometer, but it was, it is kind of focused on kind of how leading edge process nodes are made nowadays. Nowadays, what you have a situation is starting in the 2000s, you had a situation where the foundry started implementing new rules. So if you can imagine what the foundry actually gives the fabless designer to make the chip is kind of like an SDK almost like APIs or design rules that they can use in conjunction with their automated design software to create the final design. What happened was over time, the, ma the manufacturing margins are so tight and now the manufacturer and the designer have to work very closely to essentially negotiate out what the process looks like. So that's why you have a situation where, for instance, TSMC and Apple, right? Apple is the first to get any new node generally, which means they're probably put giving a lot of feedback on how that node actually performs and how that node actually is implemented, what trade-offs are going to be made in terms of you can move X to get this a lot faster, but you have to put up with Y, which could mean lower yield or some sort of power constraint, something like that. It used to be where every year, every two years, the process just gets better and everything gets better on all the different levels. It's not like that anymore. Ever since for the past two decades, it's and in the de last decade, especially, you're having a situation where you have to make all these different negotiations between these two parties. But Apple works very closely with TSMC. They designed the chips for TSMC to manufacture as a customer. They gave a lot of feedback. 
on their processes. And I think they're also they're the biggest customer. They provide 25% of, of TSMC's revenue. They provide the volume to basically pipe clean a bunch of the process itself and get it working at a high yield. There's no other company like Apple. So they make an incredibly sophisticated product at incredibly high volume. So game changer. Mm. So if I were to tie it back, then what are the factors that have actually been responsible for the global chip shortage that has been happening before the current re receding economy with the deteriorating conditions that are ongoing at the moment? Yeah. Specifically, what happened was that when the pandemic hit and everyone had to go home and be stuck at home and uh, and everyone started buying new laptops and everyone started buying new computers or from home, distance learning, all that other stuff. At the same time, you had a situation where these large cloud pro computing providers like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they started scaling up at a really high rate. And they're, they're trying to build out capacity for all the new stuff that's coming on that's to accommodate this new world. And cloud computing chips like Intel Xeons or AMDs, whatever CPUs and GPUs from NVIDIA turned out to be incredibly profitable. So what happened was when the economic downturn hit and everyone, everyone on the lower end of the industry basically was like, okay, this is like 2008 again, we're going to shut everything down, cut our costs. But what happened was that when you do, do that, TSMC, all the foundries basically moved everyone up the line and moved all the cloud computing up the line and moved all the other customers up the line. And what happened was when demand came roaring back in the summer of 2000, I guess, 20 now, 2020, the, the, the car makers and all the industrial guys needed to bring products back, but you can't make a chip that fast. So it, it takes months to make a chip from order confirmed to delivery. So that's, that's, that's a big thing. And what happened was that there was a lag and there continues to be a lag of some sorts in specific things. But I think there's indications now that the, the chip shortage at higher ends is largely over. So what, what can the industry do then to increase the supply to meet the demand of the chip shortage? Is it just by building more fabs or fabrication plants? I mean, what are the trade-offs that like companies like TMS, TSMC need to do in order to increase chip production? Uh, they can increase throughput. They can increase yield. So uh, that's a little harder with like TSMC and UMC because they're doing incredibly high yields already. But just make sure you're getting more chips from each particular wafer would be good. You are basically, no, there's there's really nothing uh, other than just building more fabs. At some point, you have to just build more fabs if the demand is high enough. You do see situations where they're raising prices where they said, hey, look, you want to get your product done fast and you pay. People mm. complain about that, but that seems very natural to me. But they actually pass the cost to the consumer, right? <laughs> Which means our iPhones and laptops will be more and more expensive. I would argue that your iPhone is worth far more than what you pay for it. I agree with you on that. <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't appreciate that, which, which, is, which is why I'm pretty interested to know. So I want to zoom into TSMC because they are leading the semiconductor race. I think it always beats me that like everybody keeps asking me the same question. It's like, what are their key competitive advantages that they have which the rest cannot replicate because the word on the street is always they have the talent, they have the talent. But then what about the other things that they have economies of skill with building things like a gigafat? I think you can never boil down a $300 billion company to just one thing. I will attempt to try, but like I would say the one thing that they have that no one else has is the customers. They have the incredible breadth of customers. They have a portfolio that basically no one else has. It's kind of like a social network. Everyone's on it because everyone else is on it and they protect their customers very closely and they treat them all equally and can be kind of cold to them. There was an interesting situation a couple weeks ago where Apple tried, TSMC tried to raise prices on Apple, right? Uh, three to 6% or something. I don't remember what it was. And they tried to raise prices on it and Apple came back and said, no. Apple was like, no, I'm not going to take these higher prices. And then 
that was the news that came out. And then everyone was waiting, right? Because NVIDIA is watching, I guess AMD's watching, AMD's like what Lisa Su is coming this month to Taiwan to talk to TSMC. They're all watching what Apple will do because Apple manages to ram TSMC down with these price decreases. Then what will happen is that it has TSMC now has to eat price increases, price the uh, cost increases for everyone else. So it's a big deal. TSMC held the line, and I guess Apple ate the price increase. So the portfolio of customers is very powerful, and they they really mean it when they say they don't treat anyone favorably. When I think in the anniversary when Maurice Chang held a very important sort of farewell for himself, there was Jeff Williams yeah. was there. There were all the CEO of the well-known chip companies all sitting in the same panel right over there. I actually watched the entire video because that's the best time you get the most leading thinkers of semiconductors on that panel. And you're not going to learn anything more if you don't sit there and watch the video for two hours on YouTube. The guy's a, the guy's a legend. Yeah. But is there any other key competitive advantages? I mean, when we talk about talent, is it the engineers that's really required to get the use? Or is it just the the chip, the people who doing the fabrication processes? And that's a skill that a lot of people seem to think is not very easily transferred. If let's say I were tomorrow were to transplant the whole of TSMC out to somewhere else, you can't because the expertise is not replicable. There is there's a couple of things I would say is that I've seen a lot of comments on the channel saying, oh, move TSMC out, move TSMC to America, move TSMC to Alaska or whatever. You can't move TSMC because if you ever see these foundries, these foundries are the size of soccer fields. They're massive. They're six stories high. You can't move them. And they're they're very, very specialized engineering. I think what TSMC has that a lot of companies don't have, yes, talent is a big deal, but that talent works in a sort of culture that's militarized, basically. They, they combine incredible talent with incredible execution. I think the execution part is very important. I think one of the things that TSMC does is that they tend to hit their targets. When they say they're going to build something or they're going to do something, they do it. I think that when you contrast that with other companies in the industry, like for example, a particular company in America that says and sets a certain deadline and misses it repeatedly, that has an effect on your credibility. TSMC has always said that they're going to hit a certain number. It's like a pretty good chance that they'll hit it. It, it reminds me a lot in, of another Chinese company that had very similar features called Huawei. <laughs> no comment there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but then they also produce talent that is being absorbed by other companies. I remember listening to one YouTube video that you did on the TSMC renegade scientists that move over to Samsung as well, right? So their talent is actually also transferring skill sets to the other competitors in that situation? It's a problem. And I think the situation is kind of like, well, to be fair, people have the right to pick new jobs and pick where they want to work. On the other hand, if you work in, if you're a nuclear weapons scientist in the United States, you can't exactly go wherever you want to go to. So I think it's just a recognition of strategic importance. And what happened with the Mong with TSMC is an situation I think a company and everyone else has learned a lot from. And the interesting thing is that all of, if you noticed last year, SMIC's three board member, three Taiwanese board members all resigned their positions from SMIC. Two of them returned to the Taiwan or the United States, more the United States. The Among Song, still CEO. It's very interesting. I, I, I wonder why is that? Mm. And then the other thing is they also have economies or skill in building the gigafab. Actually, to, to really give like some, you said there's like soccer fields, right? Is it because of the amount of the equipment that's required to actually generate the amount of chips that they need to specifically sort of meet the demand from the rest of the world, from your desktops, laptops, all the way to cars now? Yes, yes. Your foundry, these fabs are massive. Like I cannot overstate how big these are. Like I think there's a video on the channel where, you base, where I have some photos of it. They are... Titanic. And the reason why they're so big is because well, they have a lot of duplication in it. There's a lot of machines in there that basically can provide situations where if a machine is down for maintenance or it's being used, parts of other jobs, like wafers and other jobs in the midst of being their fabrication, 
can be rerouted to the identical machine somewhere in the same clean room. And that means more wafers get done at a fast speed. That's the definition of scale. You wow. have so many more machines that can do so much more. That's almost like saying that they are like an AWS. It's different. Instead of spinning a cloud instance, you're spinning semiconductors. If one of the fabs go out of line and then you just spin up another one to, to, to continue that process. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Like they're, 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 it's a factory. And I think that's the thing that you, that you have to keep your mind, keep in your head. Even though with all the sophistication, all the tools, it's just factory. If you have two ovens and you're trying to cook a bunch of pizzas, much easier if you got two ovens rather than one. You'll get mm. more pizza now. And, and that explains why when somebody say we should just move you TSMC back to the US, it becomes nearly impossible, right? Because to build the same gigafabs in the US is going to cost you a bomb. I don't even think it's feasible. It cannot be done. I don't even know if there's enough people in Arizona to, 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 to handle all that. I mean, these... These there's thousands of people working at this at this factory, and it's there's not just one fab, right? There's 18, 21 fabs in. All right, I would say there's eighteen or seventeen fabs in Taiwan, and they're scattered all across Taichung, Tainan, and Xinchu. They're massive. Yeah, and like they're incredible. The engineering is just ridiculous. They they sit in the middle of this ecosystem that is incredibly geared towards making them work. From the construction contractors, the maintenance people, all the suppliers, they all build areas near the fab to basically say, we will make sure this fab is working 100% of the time. And then I think the most interesting part is, what does the current TSMC supply chain look like? And of course, that in the interdependency between ASML and TSMC, which we talked about a little bit earlier, but that's also partially because they were invested by the same entity, which is Philips, in the early days. And that was also the reason why ASML and TSMC has such a deep relationship. They have a deep relationship and it's been on for a very long time. I think it's, a, it's an interesting relationship because the two have been working together for so long and they help each other a lot. And Taiwan is one of the few places where ASML has like an R&D center specifically for, and specifically for UV, where they're working directly with TSMC to make sure UV is working at the highest level. TSMC also has a bunch of other suppliers. I think their supply chain is 300 or so companies. The, in, the chain is very large and it's most of, actually interestingly, a lot of it's coming from Japan. A lot of it's coming from the United States. A lot of these supplies and raw materials come from outside of the island. So they need to be brought in constantly. And that's, that's interesting to look at because you, it's, it makes it, I try to make it always clear that like TSMC and Taiwan's kind of semiconductor ecosystem, which includes UMC, Vanguard, all these other companies, right? Micron has a, has a fab in Taiwan as well, right? Basically all of these are not like isolated entities. They need to be integrated within the greater ecosystem to continue to work. If there's for any reason this happens that those products can't get to TSMC or the trains get disrupted in a significant way, it all stops. Which will be pretty problematic, right? With the current geopolitical tensions that are ongoing. <laughs> Might be a problem. But, yeah, but we, but, we are not, we, but we are not talking about that. I'm much more keen to dive a little bit more deeper I mean, since Maurice Chang has retired, so who are the key people in TSMC? And I think you really talk a little bit about the corporate culture. It's very militarized. It's very execution driven. Any other features of the company? I don't know who is like the number one, number two people now in TSMC. I only, the only name that I associate with the company is Maurice Chang. That's all. <laughs> yeah, from an outsider point of view, right? Like, like Foxconn, we always think about Terry Go. It doesn't matter now, even he... He has moved on. He's we still no Foxconn from Terry Go. It's like, <laughs> yeah. The key people on TSMC, I would probably say is like the, the you have the the chairman, right? The chairman is the top guy. That's Mark Leo. You have the CEO, CCE Wei. And then I would say also very important are your R&D people. I talked about Lo Wei Jian. And then you also have the the VP of Fab Ops, who I talked about in the video as well. So you, you have a lot of people who are kind of really responsible at the very top to keeping the company at kind of its highest highest performing 
keep an eye on the R and D spot. I would say the R and D spot is is very interesting because that guy basically oversees all the innovations, the in house innovations that make TSMC perform better than its cus than its competitors, right? And that position for a long time was held by kind of many of TSMC's legends. Jiang Changyi, Liang Mengsong was part was kind of the secondary guy in there too. But like when I was doing the research for the video for the Liang Mengsong video, I read that the current like R and D SVP uh, Dr. Lo basically was like, oh, he wanted to retire, but the the company had him keep keep on going because they he's too valuable to retire. It's, it's very interesting. But he, that there's someday that retirement must come, right? Um, I, I guess, I guess the question is, how does the younger talent within the TSMC would rise? And I think you are alluding to the fact that they probably one important position they must have is the head of R and D of TSMC. Yeah, I think the thing is the the culture is very ruthless, not ruthless and like they're they're big, com- they're just like any other big company. But like the thing is, they need, you need to execute. And I think the that R and D spot is important and that's where previously leaks seem to have or like situations where really great talent have left for that reason and i think if you have a situation where the rnd people are starting to leave that's going to other competitors that's a concern because that's where that's those people know everything in the system and you want to make sure that they stay happy or they're probably not happy, but they're probably continuing to 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 work for TSMC. I don't think anyone at TSMC sounds really happy work to work there. <laughs> I mean, it's quite interesting because if I were to contrast that with Intel, I mean, maybe the first two founders plus maybe Andy Grove and couple and maybe one generation down, they're all engineers before they became CEOs. It's very engineering centric. It's only when they start switching to the business people to take over and they end up missing the mobile wave and the the CTO, Pat Kalzinger, was was actually left the company to join VMware and then came back as the CEO. It, it shows probably technology talent is much more important in running a semicon company. I mean, from, from that point of view, do you, do you find it that way as well? Or TSMC. I think the interesting thing is Intel hit a situation where they had a, their 1990s and their 1980s were really good, and that was partly because the technology was moving so fast that they were they were so good at like pushing more Moore's law, right? Because the situation was they the technology had so much space to give, there was so much fat to cut. Then they hit in the 2000s situations where suddenly it wasn't the case. And it started to lag. I think even in their case, the the company Intel's R and D, their technology, and their kind of man, their hardware, whatever their process manufacturing per- performed quite well. I don't know why the Intel stopped hitting the nodes, but the nodes were hard to hit anyways, and they just got caught in a bad situation. The technology, it's much harder to push the limits of semiconductors than it was before, and the economic incentive to do so continually shrinks mm. but also the paradigm shift as well you have the foundries and then you have people you can design the chip and then get others to manufacture that paradigm because intel was fully vertically integrated in the past i think the bigger paradigm they missed was the move to mobile they missed the move to mobile intel was lucky to catch the move to cloud but it looks like they're going to get their they're going to get their clocks cleaned by this move to from the to like custom ARM servers in the cloud, ARM chips in the cloud. And I think ARM, chi- like you're going to see TSMC and all these other companies eat, eat Intel's lunch, at least in the, in the data center business. That's going to be bad. It's going to be bad for Intel. Yeah. And then the surprise was that they actually had the ability to acquire ARM at one point in time and they didn't do it. <laughs> so which is really, really sad from that point. But I want to come back to TSMC again, but how are they performing in 2022 and what are the key highlights and economic concerns on them based on the update that we've done so far on, about the company? They're, they're now generating nearly $70 billion now in revenue for the year, which is insane. I could never have, like we, nobody could have ever imagined that they're growing this fast. And there's growing, the question is, 
can they continue to grow this fast as the economy continues to deteriorate? We don't know. And somehow, I think my friend at Doug, Doug at Fabricated Knowledge pointed out, TSMC is still accelerating their growth. They were growing, their last monthly revenue showed 30% growth month over year over year. And it's like, that's insane. That's insane for a company that in is sitting in a spot that they're essentially the industry. The industry, everyone else in the industry seems to be reporting very difficult earnings, but this company continues to grow. And not only that, they're risking 50, $100 billion over the next year to build, next three years to build. 10 factories, 10 or 11 factories across Taiwan and the United States and maybe Germany and maybe Japan now. So it's kind of it's crazy. And it's probably interesting because I think people for always forget Silicon Valley started off with semiconductors serving the military. And even with war, semiconductors are still a very, very important components in any system in the world, anything that touches the electronic system, there's definitely a semiconductor chip sitting in somewhere inside. And then with precision, of course, the semiconductor chips are the higher, and which also explains why TSMC's growth is so big, because the, the technology itself is pretty a point tech from that point of view, right? You know, it's kind of interesting. We don't really know why they're growing so fast. Personally, my guess would be this is around the time Apple starts delivering chips. Like they start delivering chips for the new iPhone to Apple, but 30% for a node that generally is not that much, that's the same as last year's node. Like, so, so the new iPhone 14 Pro, for instance, is using a chip with a four nanometer process, which is essentially your five nanometer process, but improved. If you're showing 20 to 30% revenue growth, that does not sound like a five nanometer to four nanometer jump. Something weird about that. And we don't know who they're else selling to. We know and NVIDIA is ramping up their new GPUs, their AI accelerators. AMD seems to be growing well, but AMD just reported bad earnings. So now we don't know. Yeah, I'm very curious. I'm very be interested to see what, what they report in their coming ar- earnings. Maybe this will be my final question then. What's the future of semiconductor industry at this point in time? And to be quite honest, are we really close to the end of Moore's Law? Moore's Law died in 2011, I would say, when we switched from planar transistors to tra- FinFET 3D transistors. I think the, 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 the future of the semiconductor industry is you're going to see a lot more specialization, a lot more specification and a lot more single systems made up of different packaging solutions where we're going to use other technologies to take certain functions off the silicon. And there's going to be economic consequences of that, some of which are not good. But at the same time, you if you look at the fundamentals of the industry, you have the, the fundamentals are very good because as it turns out, there's some of the only ways to add more functionality to certain things is to put more semiconductors or put more improved semiconductors in a certain thing. So I see the fundamentals as being good, but now the companies that will at, will benefit from them are increasingly going to be different from the ones in, that, that from the from the old companies. And it all started with the AI chips, right? Because they are the one, the GPUs are also, they, because AI, they, they actually had a very specialized chip just for that specific purpose. And that actually also kicked off this specialization that you're talking about. There's always been kind of like a, a, a trend to build specialized chips for a certain thing. The AI chips are interesting because you're, you're tapping into the AI sort of world, right? I think the interesting thing, what we're going to see coming forward is like, is machine learning, is deep, is the deep learning revolution or so called we call it this new AI world. Is that sitting on top of hardware? Is, is that tied to hardware? If that's tied to hardware, and I was going to do a video about this, I don't know what to do about it, but like, we have a situation where we can't advance in AI without a node shrink to make bigger GPUs. So you would have a situation where NVIDIA releases the A100, right? They, they used to have the V100. Now they come up with a new A100. The V100 used to be on a or 12 nanometer. The A100 is on a 7. And then uh, now you have your H100, which is on 5 nanometer, right? You had a situation where every like, you would have 
every time that NVIDIA releases this new generation of GPUs, you have this new kind of leg up in the performance of our AI models. And if that's the situation going to be, then it's interesting to think about the economic consequences of that. I don't know if this, any of this is making sense, but I'm just saying that basically, if we still have to depend on a node shrink to advance deep learning, that sounds like a bad situation to be in. Okay. I think that is a question that we will come back at some point to talk about it. And I hope that you will get that <laughs> video ready at some point. <laughs> and Jawai, thank you for coming on the show. And it's really fun to really have the discussion in person over, over Zoom. And in closing, I have two key questions. My first question is, um, any recommendations that have inspired you recently? I watched Minions 2, The Rise of Gru. I was very inspired by that recently. Good movie. Is it? <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. I'm, I'm actually planning to get it on iTunes. <laughs> so I'll be watching that pretty soon. Thanks for the recommendation, by the way. How can my audience find you? Just watch the YouTube channel. Google, uh, look me up on Asianometry. You'll see the rest from there. Yeah, you have a Patreon page as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you watch, if you watch our videos, you see all of it. But the, it all flows from the YouTube channel. Watch the YouTube okay. channel on that thing. No, I'll yeah. definitely put a link on that. And you can definitely find us on anywhere a podcast platform just give us a five star rating on uh, apple Podcasts, and definitely drop me your feedback at a-n-a-l-y-s-e asia on twitter and once again many thanks for coming on the show and i definitely would look forward to talking to you again thank you for having me have a good one <laughs>